revision. Okay, revision. So I'm saying it's still Excellent. active. Uh, <laughs> on the uh, history of public markets and food policy in New York City. So, Babette. Hi, and um, thank you very much for changing the order. Um, before I get started, I want to say thanks to Alex for inviting us. And I also want to point out that my colleague and true farmer, Mara Gittleman, is in the audience. So after I sneak at her on 715, she's going to be here to answer questions that I don't answer. Um, and it's just enter to move ahead, right? You'd think I'd know this by now. Oh, sure. And there's a bunch of seats up front if anybody's having a hard time hearing. Thank you very much for that. Um, there we are. OK, great. I'm just going to go through sort of the history of the farm very briefly. It's a very short history. Um, and then talk a little bit about the technical aspects of the farm, which again, Mara will answer more questions. And then some of the things that I think are particular opportunities, just because we happen to be an institution, uh, an educational institution. Um, the idea of having a farm at Kingsborough started at least five, six years ago. Um, we had some food courses. We had a tourism and hospitality program. There's a lot of land at Kingsborough, for those of you who have never seen the campus. Um, and we had a couple small efforts with container gardens, um, something that was an outgrowth of our, of our food classes. Um, over the last year and a half, we finally got our culinary arts program off the ground. Um, so it's a, it's a degree, um, and it's the only public um, culinary arts degree in New York City, which we're very excited about, with close to 200 students um, in our first year. Um, and there's always been a lot of institutional interest in doing something with farming. Um, that goes from the president, um, Regina Perugi, down to our buildings and ground staff, who's been incredibly supportive. Um, and like I said, we have a lot of land. These um, temporary buildings that have just been outfitted with um, smart technologies, um, are, we're on an asphalt lot. Um, and one of these areas was, was pinpointed as being a potential farm. Um, what made this possible, um, this is Gus Jones, or August Jones, who's our um, farmer, um, was sometime this winter, uh, I think Jonathan Deutsch, one of my colleagues, um, ran into a woman named Linda Bryant, who works for Active Citizen Project. Um, and they began talking, and for the first time, things moved quickly. And by the end of February, we had signed an MOU with um, Active Citizen Project and with their EATS project, which is um, setting up community gardens with the express purpose of teaching people how to grow their own food. Uh, it's the first time they've partnered with a college, um, and it's the first time I think anything's ever moved this quickly at Kingsborough. Um, buildings and grounds immediately cleared the ground. Um, as soon as it was leveled, lumber was delivered, and they've started building what's going to be a total of 30 beds. Um, it's a high productive farm. Uh, production's 12 months a year. There's going to be a hoop house. Um, we're talking to, you know, resources have all of a sudden started popping up. And we'll talk a little bit about the staffing of the, or the, the, the labor that's being provided. But in terms of resources, as soon as this started happening, um, somebody in the biology department whispered that there was an unused greenhouse someplace located in one of the science buildings that we have yet to see, but may end up being something that we can draw on. Um, the labor for this, um, the agreement with Active Citizen Project, and I think this is something that was important to think about. Every time we thought about farming, the big question was, how are we going to make this happen in terms of labor? We don't have the expertise. We know how to cook. We don't know how to farm. Um, Active Citizen Project brought um, Gus Jones on board along with their marketing expertise and their ability to sort of fund the project for the first three years from their side. What that does is it gives us as an institution three years to figure out how to take the product from this high production farm and turn it into a sustainable business model so that we're able to pay for instruction but most importantly for farmers. Um, a head farmer, absolutely, and most likely in our case will be an assistant farmer as well. Right now, the bulk of the work is being done by students. And so it's really been up to us to find a way of structuring that work um, so that they're able to either earn college credit and or um, other sort of incentives, like there's talk about using work study money to have this rolled into it, rolling it into other sorts of educational opportunities. Um, it's not a, it's not sort of a, um, it's not a hobby farm, and that was something we had to make very clear to students as they signed up to help, was that this wasn't something where we want someone to drop by for one hour or one afternoon once in a while. This was really asking for a commitment. Two days a week, four hours at a time minimum. Um, 
because part of the problem is, of course, it's production, it's high production. We don't have time to be training, and there's just, there's Mara there once in a while, and Gus is running the show, and that's it. We don't have people running around just starting over and teaching people how to fill beds. Um, New York City Department of Transportation, Assist of Transportation of Sanitation was, was able to provide the uh, compost for that. Is that, that is right, right? I was hoping that. Um, and you can see the first set of beds was built um, earlier this month. They're filled and then we're seated more or less immediately. Our youngest volunteer, it's hard to avoid very cute faces. Um, and the seated beds. And this all happened in a matter of about three weeks, which is pretty amazing considering the pace of things at CUNY. Um, like I said, there's also a hoop house. Um, in order to have seeds started, in order to have um, a worm bed for composting, um, and to continue production throughout the winter months. One thing that's really interesting with ACP's model and what was appealing to us, because we are still sort of a business-oriented program, is that while their primary mission is to make great food available at low prices to low-income and, and moderate-income communities, their business model depends on selling a portion of whatever it is that they grow to restaurants um, at market price. And so they do things like a delicious microgreens mix, which is sold for $26 a pound. Um, at the same time, we're growing broccoli and kale and chard and things that can be sold in the community gardens that they run and hopefully are going to be sold at community gardens we run once we can get past all the rules and layers of regulation that we've got to figure out from CUNY Central. Um, so they really, their sustainability model is, is, is really fixed on serving two markets simultaneously. What's appealing to us as a culinary arts program is that we get access to great produce that we'd be purchasing from the farm. Um, our students get a chance to see the whole farm to table experience and get involved in it um, to whatever extent they want to get involved. Um, and they also get to see, they also start to get to see sort of the process of things growing on the ground and seeing the different stages of a single plant, for example. Um, in terms of the technicalities, and I'm sorry that I'm kind of wandering back and forth on this a little bit, but the slides are, the slides are dictating what I'm mentioning. Um, the, farm is going to eventually have rainwater collection and one of the examples of where our buildings and ground staff really went above, above and beyond. While ACP was very happy with rain barrels, our, the head of buildings and grounds is already looking for a way to do an underground reservoir so that we can really maximize rainwater collection. Um, so as I talked a little bit about already, production and distribution, Active Citizens Project has four farmers markets. The culinary arts program at Kingsborough would be a customer. The KCC Farmers Market, if we're allowed to have this happen, would be selling produce to staff, to students, and to students that have, that are eligible for um, benefits like EBT or WIC on a sliding scale. What we've decided to do, though, is not to do it through an EBT machine, but simply to do it through a sliding scale and an electronic card so that we preserve people's anonymity. Um, and lastly, the, the biggest clients of this would be restaurants. Um, there's already sort of an arc of Brooklyn restaurants that's been a steady client food pantries, and um, Mara was contacted by the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, who's interested in buying produce that's produced by us. Um, in terms of scheduling the work, or structuring the work, um, this is a very long explanation. I'm always, I'm usually really good about keeping short slides. Um, we're offering a summer course, but in addition to this, we're also offering the opportunity for people to sign up for a continuing ed course over the summer for six weeks, six week sessions, um, that would, you know, somebody asked me, what's the curriculum? And I said, well, the curriculum's kind of dictated by, you know, by the farm. So if you arrive and, and harvesting is taking place, you're going to be taking part in harvesting. If you arrive and older plants are being ripped up and new seeds are being laid, that's going to be the curriculum. Um, if we're processing stuff for market, that's going to be the curriculum. Um, and lastly, in addition to that, because we are an institution, and I find it a really interesting opportunity to have a farm like this um, on a campus, especially one that has a business model like this. Um, not only is there room for development of more sort of culinary arts related courses that would use the farm as a resource in a variety of ways, 
But in terms of just simply food processing and product development, um, we have someone right now has proposed using the farm also as the basis for more medicinal or botanical or beauty and health products based on things that can be grown at the farm. Um, we've already got one faculty member who's joined our interest group who wrote a grant that while it's not for the farm, it's for a children's garden. Um, that would be a nice kind of offshoot, different location though. Um, and there's been interest amongst our faculty immediately in terms of wrapping the hands-on experience into learning communities that would combine two academic courses with hands-on learning. So I think while it's both interesting in terms of changing the perspective of of possible land use at urban colleges, particularly public institutions that don't usually do this kind of work, although Brooklyn's a, a really clear exception. Um, I think the other thing that's really exciting about what we've been able to do so far, and keep reminding ourselves that this has only been three months, so we're really like just seeding the ground of what, I, that's a terrible pun, I really apologize. Um, in terms of what's possible, is that what I, what I like about it is that there's already willingness to challenge the idea that even in a college setting that the hands-on experience of farming is actually legitimate learning and that that not always that doesn't always need to be framed by heavy curriculum or heavy lecture or other sorts of activities but that simply the action of farming is being is being recognized as being a legitimate form of learning um, and I'm going to leave it at that and if there are questions later um, like I said I think I might be around for a little bit and Mara will answer those for me, so I say thank you already, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Babette. And now we'll turn over to Deborah Grigg, going a little bit farther north in Brooklyn. Uh, Deborah is the Urban Agriculture Coordinator at East New York Farms, born and raised in Brooklyn. She feels lucky to have been working in the food access field for over eight years on farms, and at community and citywide organizations like Hawthorne Valley Farm, Just Food, and the US, uh, UCSC Farm and Garden Program. At East New York Farms, she works with youth and adults to address food justice in the East New York neighborhood in Brooklyn by promoting local sustainable agriculture and community-led economic development. Deborah. Hi. How's everyone doing? A lot of listening. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask a question to everyone. Um, could you please raise your hand if you have a family member who has diabetes? Okay. So if you lived in East New York, that would probably be all of you. Um, and that is one of the reasons why East New York Farms started in the area that we did, in the neighborhood that we did, driven by community residents' desire to kind of make a better neighborhood out of the one that they lived in and, and felt so committed to. Um, so East New York Farms, our mission is to organize youth and adults to address food access issues, which obviously are directly related to health-related um, disease, and promote community, um, our communities through local sustainable agriculture and community-led economic development. And I'm going to be talking about exactly what that means, because that's a lot of random words. Um, and thank you, Lori for talking a little bit about the history of urban farming and community gardens because that's sort of where um, I'm gonna start. Um, East New York, who knows where East New York is? Okay, so I grew up in New York and I didn't know where East New York was when I was growing up. It's at the end of the three train all the way out in Brooklyn, so if you fall asleep on the train, it's really late night and you wake up and you don't know where you are, that's probably East New York. You might have driven through there on the way to JFK. It's almost Queens. It's near the Rockaways. It's a great neighborhood. It has been farmed since the Dutch. There's actually a Dutch church right across from our community center. Um, there is one of the oldest children's gardens, Victory Gardens, in the United States. It started in 1901. That is in East New York near Highland Park. So it's been farmed for many, many, many years. But we're going to talk about it since the 70s. Um, sorry, it's kind of a small picture, but um, this is what East New York and actually many parts of New York City looked like um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Basically brown lots, vacant lots. Um, the Bronx was burning during the World Series. Um, you could see the helicopters, you know, the helicopters went over to show you a shot of the stadium and all you saw was fires across the Bronx and vacant lots. That's what East New York looked like too. And neighborhood residents um, 
you know, the neighborhood had a history of farming, but residents weren't necessarily from that neighborhood. They were from the South, they were from the Caribbean, um, and they had a history of farming in their past. So they decided that these lots, this neglect, um, they were gonna change it um, and create things like this. So East New York Farms started um, in 1995 out of a Pratt Institute community planning process, um, local organizations and individuals got together and they said, um, we have these needs in our neighborhood. There's a lack of open space. There's a lack of fresh, healthy food. One in three people is under the age of 18. So there's a lot of young people with energy and we have resources. We have gardeners who know what they're doing from back where they're from and we have over 60 community gardens in, in East New York, which is more than any other neighborhood in, in Brooklyn, probably the city. Um, and we have all these young people who want something to do. So let's put these two things together and start an organization that can address that. So in 1998, East New York Farms started, and um, I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about all of our programs and what we do to sort of address food access. Um, so the first is our Half Acre Farm. It's the United Community Center's youth farm. Um, and we grow fruit and vegetables. Last year we grew about 13,000 pounds of, of food. It was about $11,000 um, at the farmer's market. And, and that's, that's, that's low. Um, our, farm, our farm could produce more, but we have a primary activity of teaching. Um, we teach gardeners in the neighborhood and we teach youth. And when you're running a farm with 33 teenagers, um, you might not have the highest production that you think you would, um, but that's okay. Um, so we do a lot of things that we model for other gardens in the neighborhood and kind of reach out um, to, to people to kind of help them produce. So we have a composting system here, which is under renovation, and that's become increasingly more important in the past few years because the composting program that the city has under the guise of leaf collection is often the first to get cut when they're budget cuts. And it is going to get reinstated, but it gets cut maybe every three years. So um, <laughs> we've decided to start sort of community composting, getting people to drop off and try to do the most high intensive composting that we can. Um, some vermicomposting, but trying out different bin styles to get the highest um, volume that we can. Um, and we do a lot of cover crop, which is sort of deliberate green um, manure that we grow over the winter and sometimes during the summer and kind of replenishes um, a lot of the, I guess, nutrients that we take out of it by growing so intensively. Um, so you can see some beautiful root nodules right there. Um, that's nitrogen going back into our soil. Um, it's very exciting. We also do um, rainwater harvesting, try to divert some of that rainwater from the sewers. And we just put in a solar fan in our greenhouse. Um, definitely not a heated greenhouse, but now it has some nice ventilation. And we do a lot of research in terms of varieties of what we grow. So last year we grew about 20 varieties of hot peppers. Um, so this is an example of that, trying to see what community members really liked, what grew the best, what was our highest yield, blah, blah, blah. Um, and our greatest resource, I think, at the, the UCC Youth Farm is our youth program. We work with 33 teenagers from ages 13 to 17. Um, they're paid, and they grow and sell all of the food um, that we have at our farm. And they also work at some of the community gardens and backyard gardens in the neighborhood. Um, we do a lot of leadership development with them. We don't expect that they're all gonna become farmers. It'd be great if they'd be some of the five million. We actually have one who's in school in um, Indiana right now, which is really exciting. Um, but we do want them to grow up to make intelligent choices and be able to be leaders in their community and ask those questions that we really need to ask of our food system these days. So that's some of them. That's a composting class. Um, but we also talk to them about you know, gender and race and food access and some of the more social issues behind food in the neighborhood. Um, they do a lot of neighborhood outreach as well, so they're always interacting with um, adults, older adults, and kind of gaining that sort of experience. Um, and they sell at our farmer's market, which is the most fun. Um, 
Okay, so our gardeners, this is kind of our second major program. We work with some of the 60 community gardens in the neighborhood as well as many backyard gardeners um, doing workshops, giving them resources, um, making it easier for them to continue gardening and also ensuring that their membership is strong. Um, so not just physically, but um, kind of interacting with the community around them. And we bring our youth out there a lot. You can see some Rekia and Kalia. Um, and Kamani um, were helping to build this compost tumbler. So there's a lot of interaction and learning, um, intergenerational learning. Um, and I think kind of one really great example of that is one of our youth, Peace, her family is from Nigeria and her father used to farm. And she, she doesn't remember this at all. She moved here when she was three years old. But she wanted to do this program because she knew that her parents had done this before. And she joined our program, and now she's a third year intern. And her and her father garden at one of the local gardens and grow food for market. And she teaches him what she learned about growing in New York City. And he um, and her mother teach her your open words for the things that she's growing. And it's kind of a really awesome experience, I think. <laughs> Um, these are some of our ladies using power drills. Um, and this is Gemma. We do a beekeeping apprenticeship, just trying to help gardeners not just grow food, but do entrepreneurial efforts. And beekeeping is one of those great things because honey is sort of unlimited demand at our farmer's market. Um, but I actually just helped Gemma install bees into another hive this afternoon. Um, so you can come in a couple months and get some East New York honey. Um, and the last of our programs um, that we do is our farmer's market. Um, we run two farmer's markets. One is much larger than the other. And basically, that was kind of one of the first things that started. Um, we had one gardener who was on the side of the street selling some extra vegetables. And now we shut off the street. We have about 25 vendors, farmers from upstate. We accept WIC and EBT and other coupons that people who um, get benefits can, can use at the market specifically um, to feed their kids and older adults as well. Um, and it's, it's really fun. You should all come out. Um, but our youth, again, sell at that market um, and our other market. Um, gardeners sell at that market. Our top gardener last year made about $3,000. And, and this is not her full-time job. Um, she has a full-time job, so this is kind of on the side. Um, but she farmed in Jamaica. She loves it. Grows Kalaloo, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, we have a fish vendor from Brooklyn, all sorts of prepared food, um, cooking demonstrations to kind of teach people, especially the WIC beneficiaries, women, infants, and children who bring their coupons to the market how to use things when they're not used to cooking. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things about our market is it's kind of this cultural sharing center. Um, this. I guess you can see here that Joemi is holding his uh, bitter melon. I don't, who here has tried bitter melon before? What do you think? Yeah? It's bitter. <laughs> it's great for diabetes. Um, but we have people from Jamaica coming through our market who want the leaves. They make a tea and it helps with diabetes. We have people from Trinidad um, coming through who use it green and make it with salt fish. Um, we have people from Bangladesh coming through and they want it really ripe with the sweet seeds. Um, so there's, you can really see how a lot of the vegetables that are, that we grow, that are present in our neighborhood have traveled from, you know, South Asia and Asia through the Caribbean to the U.S. Um, and you really couldn't find bitter melon organically grown in any neighborhood in New York City. You can definitely find it in Chinatown, um, probably not organic, but maybe grown in somebody's backyard. I'm not sure. Um, but you can see up in the corner, that's one of our youth, and she actually decided to start a um, henna stand at the market. Um, uh, there's a really large community from Bangladesh that's emerging. Um, and then a lot of farmers are now starting to do kind of value-added sorts of products like hot sauce and things like that. Um, but our market is, I don't know, it's just so exciting. There's people from you know, Russian senior citizens who come from Starrett City. There's people from all over the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic people from Central America and Latin America, um, people from Bangladesh are moving in. It's, it's a really colorful place to be. And uh, we try to celebrate that through um, a lot of the musical performances that we have every Saturday, um, story hour with kids, carnival. Um, but you should come visit us every Saturday starting at the end of June, um, the end of the train line. 
and we're always looking for people to come and volunteer or help out or learn more about what we do. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, we do have some time, so I'll go straight to audience questions. Yes. Uh, question is, who owns the property and how do they price the vegetables? Sure. Um, so, like a lot of land that's in the city, um, our particular land is um, it's Parks Department is through Green Thumb, which is the um, organization, city organization that oversees community gardens in New York City. Um, we do that first piece of land that you saw, the vacant land that became a garden and has a market in front of it, that was owned by HPD and they approached us to develop um, a half acre community farm on that. So there's about 30 gardeners there, including us. Um, so it's a little creative, but um, there's not much private land um, available in East New York. And in terms of price setting, we look at local grocery stores in the neighborhood, um, which are few and far between. And we look at other farmers markets in other neighborhoods, and we do it someplace in the middle. Um, so our prices are much, much lower than what you would find at you know, Grand Army Plaza or Union Square. And that's because we're trying to have people who have access to coupons and things to be able to purchase at our market. And um, yeah, it seems to work out. Yes, well, we grow things naturally. We can't afford to call it organic. That costs a lot of money these days. But we don't grow with any chemicals, and, and our gardeners don't either. Other questions? I've got one, but I don't know who to address it to, but I had, uh, had mentioned Burmy compost. Compost is the worm. Uh, would you know how to separate the worms from the same compost on a large scale? The question is about vermicomposting. Is there knowledge, if not on the panel and people we know, uh, on how to separate the worms from the rest of the compost? We do that at Broom College uh, at, at large scale. Could it be done at, at large scale? Does anybody have it? Um, yeah. Do you do that in East New York? Uh, well, we don't, we don't do it on a large scale in East New York, but um, there's lots of different methods. One is a tumbler system. It's kind of a big, sort of looks like a rocket, made of screen, runs on a belt. You can hook a bike up to it or a motor, and it tumbles, and basically, when you put the compost with the worms in the top, it tumbles down. But there are also many other systems where it's basically like upscale of a home system where you're feeding a certain side of the bins, the worms go to that side of the bin, and then you can dig out the other parts. Um, other people just kind of take it as a loss because there's so many, you know, the worms multiply so fast anyway. Um, if you just harvest half of it, the other half will have worms. I don't know if that's, I like the Tumblr system, it's fun.